the recording. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Neil Roth. Um, I am the CEO of Avini Health. Uh, welcome everybody this, e this afternoon and evening, depending on where you are. Today is very exciting. Uh, we're gonna do something a little special. First, I'd like to introduce the person who's gonna do something special. Um, so just as a little of a background, about 25 years ago, uh, my wife and I were in another network marketing company, and we went to the national convention, which had about what about five thousand people. And we went to one of the, the the small meetings that they have, you know, the breakaways. And in it was this young guy named Rick Dice. Really, he was almost punky then because he was just a young kid. And uh, and he started talking, and he gave this presentation. And Claire and I, those of you who know Claire, just looked at each other and we went, "Oh my God, we got to meet this guy." So we went up to meet Rick, and um, I would say it was like instant karma. We just became good friends from that day on. Uh, we've worked to together in many capacities for the last 25 years. Um, I'm going to let Rick tell his own background, but I can tell you um, he is one of the smartest men I have ever met. He's genuine. He has a heart of gold. His, his goal in life is to help people, and that's why he's created these products for us. So without further ado, uh, Rick Deitch. Yeah, Neil, thanks for having me. I, I tell you all the time, under promise, over deliver. You say, here's a guy who's going to talk. <laughs> Let him try to be impressed. Uh, as Neil told you, I, I'm a biochemist. Uh, I'm, I like to think I'm a little different in the field because I'm both a nutritional biochemist and a pharmaceutical biochemist. As a pharmaceutical biochemist, I run a company uh, called Nutrapharma. We make uh, drugs for the treatment of pain. We have antiviral drugs. We have drugs for the treatment of autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis. And we're working on organophosphate nerve agent countermeasures for the Department of Defense. So uh, that's me on the pharmaceutical side. On the nutritional side, I had the great fortune to work for the Rexall Sundown family of companies when it was the largest manufacturer of dietary supplements on the planet. And that really helped me uh, learn the basics of dietary supplements, uh, the concept of good nutrition, of using supplementation to have a longer, happier, healthier, more functional life. Uh, with my time at Rexall, uh, I formulated more than 50 different dietary supplements. I conducted more than 50 clinical studies on the use of dietary supplements. Uh, and that expanded me to uh, the consulting businesses I had after that, where I became a category creator uh, in several different product venues, product, uh, product markets. Um, at that time, I also co-authored two books, Are You Age-Wise? A Guide to Healthy Aging. I also wrote a book called Invisible Killers, which is about the toxins of the environment. And I wrote that with Dr. Stuart Longke, a pulmonologist in Los Angeles. The reason we wrote that is I had already launched my zeolite product for detoxification. And I was looking for more background on what are these toxins of the environment? What's their prevalence? Uh, where do they come from? How do they get into our bodies through food, water, air? Once they're in our bodies, what do they do to us? How do these things actually hurt us and damage us biochemically, physiologically, medically? How do they increase our, re our, our risk for disease and dysfunction? And then more importantly, can we avoid those toxins? Can we mitigate the risk of exposure? And can we actively detoxify? And to our shock, there was no source that had this sort of information. Uh, and so we wrote the book. We wrote the book, Invisible Killers, that kind of says, what are these toxins? Where do they come from? How do they affect us? And how do we detoxify? And of course, the best way to detoxify is to use our, uh, our zeolite, our activated micronized zeolite. Um, I am the category creator for activated micronized zeolite uh, when I first uh, came up with the concept that now is our cell defender product. Uh, nobody was really doing this with uh, Clinup Telolite with zeolite. I'll discuss that uh, as I get into the background of these things. Um, but uh, as Neil said, I wanted to help people. How can I help as many people as possible? And when you start thinking about the common denominators, what is making all of us sick? What is making all of us uh, at greater risk for disease, dysfunction, infection, and it is toxic exposure. It's this junk that does not belong in the body. And the funny part of it is we learn about dietary supplements. And the definition of supplements is supplemental to a healthful diet and exercise. You're taking vitamins and minerals and things like that. And the real concept of the zeolite is not to give the body anything. It's to take things out that do not belong there. And when you get out that muck and get that stuff out that don't, doesn't belong there, a cleaner, healthier body fixes itself. 
so with that, I'd like to get into the biochemistry, the background. What is a zeolite? Uh, how does it work? What, uh, what, what is our stuff? And how do we make our stuff? But first, what is, tox what is, uh, what is toxic? What do toxins do to the body? And so uh, let's see if I can do this. Go. I'll try to see if that's working. Okay. Can someone tell me if they're seeing my slide? Is it the full screen? All I good. I did. Was that right? It was. Now go back. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Let's make sure. Yes. Okay. All right, so we're gonna talk about Avini Health's uh, cell, cell Defender. And as I said, this is a master class, so it's gonna be a little deep on the science, but that's what we want. Now there is a white paper available on the Avini website. It goes into a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today, uh, but uh, let's uh, get it straight from the researcher's mouth, so to speak. Why is this not working? Here we go. The first question is, are you toxic? It's a good question. Uh, there are people that actually believe that they're not toxic. There are people that believe that they live in a pristine environment. And so they don't have to worry about toxic exposure. I actually gave a lecture like this. And I tell a story all the time in Fargo, North Dakota. And while the guy was telling me that he lives in a pristine environment, there's no toxins in him, a crop duster was dusting the field behind him. So clearly there's toxins everywhere. Uh, we've done deep ice core samples in Antarctica. And we found man-made toxins in the ice, deep ice of Antarctica. So there's no place on the planet that is free of toxic exposure. Wherever the water flows, wherever the air blows, toxins go all over the place. So whether it's in the United States or made in China or in Europe or, or Central or South America, no matter what, those toxins are in circulation and you're being exposed. So where do they come from as far as exposure? obviously from our food, the water, and the air. That's our exposure, food, water, and air. So in food, uh, there's all sorts of heavy metals, volatile organic compounds, things like that, but there's also hormones and pesticides that are used in our food products. Uh, air and water, we have cigarette smoke, we have fuel exhaust from, uh, from, uh, from automobile exhaust. Uh, we have all that stuff in the air, especially if you live in an inner city, work in a factory, where a lot of that stuff starts to, uh, to accumulate. Uh, if you travel, I, I tell you, we uh, actually do a lot of work in Japan. And I remember there would be days in Tokyo they called yellow sand days. And that's when the wind shifted from the west to the east and would blow uh, smoke from China across the Sea of Japan to Japan. And you'd be in Tokyo and the air just turned yellow. And it was yellow all day and all night. You really couldn't see anything. It's just the air quality. And anyone that lives in the inner cities, especially in valleys like in, uh, in Los Angeles, you know that you have smog days or bad air days. And there's not much we can do about it. Uh, obviously, we'll be cleaning up the environment as we go. But we want to talk about mitigating the risk of exposure, but also what you can do because you're exposed. Household chemicals, gas and oil, skincare products. I mean, pretty much everything you touch has some sort of heavy metals, volatile organic compounds, some sort of toxic exposure. Uh, now, the Nationalists for Health had set up a website called Toxtown. For some reason, I checked it today and it was down. Uh, but normally, you can go to Toxtown. It's a lot of fun to visit that website because you can click on the place around your house, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in the living room, and what are the toxins you're exposed to in those places in the house, but also around the town, go to the grocery store, the pharmacy, and it, you can kind of see where we're generally exposed uh, to toxins uh, throughout our general, throughout our life. And everything I just told you is just the tip of the iceberg. I love this picture because this shows an iceberg and what you see above the water is less than 10% of the entire iceberg. So what we know about toxic exposure is minute. It's small, 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 small. And to think of it this way, the Environmental Protection Agency has over a million chemical compounds that are considered toxins. And we talk about levels that are safe levels levels that we can be exposed to, presumably on a chronic basis that are not gonna cause disease or dysfunction. But the fact is we don't know. 
because there might be safe levels of two or three or four things, but when you have those quote unquote safe levels together, well, now it's toxic because there's compounds that form or there's interactions that occur between those separate com compounds. And there's no way to tell. There's such a huge amount of these toxic compounds. There's no way to tell what's gonna happen when they interact with each other. We're learning that over time. Uh, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. As, as uh, more and more and toxins get out into the environment, we start to see the downstream implications. I mean, uh, this isn't quite part of my toxic, uh, my toxic lecture, but look what's happened with fish along the Eastern seaboard. We're seeing more and more and more fish become hermaphroditic. Uh, and it's because women who have started, started using birth control in large numbers in the early 60s, they use the birth control, they urinate, that water goes out into the ocean, finds way in the ocean, and all those estrogens are being taken up by fish now. So now we have these huge amount of estrogenic compounds that are in seafood, in the, sea, in, in the uh, food supply, but also it's screwing up their genetics and epigenetics because of the huge amount of hormones that we're basically flushing into the toilet and washing out to sea. So it's uh, stuff that we don't think about. We think, oh yeah, we flush the toilet and it's gone. You know, but it's not, it's still in the environment. It can still come back to us. The other thing is that we talk about just the tip of the iceberg, besides what we're exposed to in our food, the water, the air, we're actually born with a lot of toxins. In fact, a, a study that was done uh, almost 20 years ago by the Environmental Working Group, uh, which is a, a public advocacy group for the environment out of Washington, DC, they found when they looked at the umbilical cord blood of newborns, over 200 toxic compounds, industrial chemicals, pollutants, pesticides, and a lot of those compounds, or some of these compounds were potentially carcinogenic. So the fact is we're born with a lot of these toxins. We have this body burden of toxins uh, from birth, and it just gets worse as we grow, eat, drink, and breathe. Um, so let's talk about the health effects of toxic exposure. What do these things do? And uh, we'll talk about how they build up too, because um, heavy metals, you know, what you have to understand about heavy metals is that they're good metals. There are metals we need to live. Calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, sodium, potassium. At micro amounts, we need copper, manganese, boron. These are metals that we need to survive. They're part of our biochemistry and biomolecules and metalloenzymes that get things done in the body. We need those to live. Why are heavy metals dangerous? Because heavy metals compete for the good metals. Metals like mercury, lead, arsenic, tin, cadmium, bismuth, aluminum, antimony, those sort of metals can compete for the good metals. If they displace the good metals, they cause disease and dysfunction. And different metals cause different disease and dysfunction. And the reason for that is that the body tries its best, and I'll talk about mechanisms of detoxification in a minute, but the body rids itself of heavy metals toxins every day, all the time. But our ability to excrete is outweighed by our exposure. Our exposure is so much higher than our ability to excrete that the body has an excess. It has to do something with it. So what the body does is called sequestration. It tries to hide the toxins and tissue where it can do as little damage as possible. So it, it tends to hide it in metabolically inert or inactive tissue, principally fat and bone. Um, but the fat, remember, there's a fatty sheath around our nerves. So some of the fat around our nerves, the myelin sheath around our nerve is full of toxins like mercury uh, and aluminum. And that's where some of those heavy metals can increase risk for nerve damage, Alzheimer's disease, and things like that. Uh, so we know, for example, mercury, aluminum, arsenic increases risk for neurologic conditions. Cadmium greatly increases risk for cancer. Uh, all these heavy metals stop, slow down metabolic processes, can stop metabolic processes, and can be carcinogenic. So let's look at an example, and I'll give you a couple of examples of molecules. So this is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. If you can see it, I don't know if you can actually see my arrow here, but this on the left is adenosine, which is a nitrogenous base. Adenosine is used for the manufacture of DNA and RNA deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. Uh, but it's also, as a nitrogenous base, it's also a signaling molecule. It can also carry energy. So the adenosine on the left 
is attached by not one, not two, by three phosphate groups, PO4s. Each one of those is highly negative. It's four oxygen surrounding a phosphate. Because they're so negative, they want to break apart. It's a strong, strong, strong negative charge, like charges repel. So this last bond between these two purple phosphates, that last bond is a high energy bond. And the only way that bond does not just break apart is it's stabilized primarily by magnesium. So active ATP is called magnesium ATP, okay? So magnesium can be displaced primarily by mercury. So imagine a mercury is bound there instead of magnesium, because normally the magnesium is there. When the body needs energy, the magnesium releases, that bond breaks. It releases energy into the environment. That energy is used to do work in the body. And you wind up with a free phosphate, an ADP, a dizzying diphosphate, and energy. It's the energy currency of the body. Whenever the body needs energy to do something, it spends ATP. But if mercury is there instead of magnesium, that magnesium, that can't come off. And that ATP molecule becomes useless. It becomes unusable. And you wind up with less cellular energy because of heavy metal toxicity. So I'm going to talk a little bit later about how zeolites work. But here's an example of a zeolite cage. Gobble, gobble, gobble. It eats up the mercury. And now magnesium, the right metal, can get to the binding site and you wind up with active ATP. And this is one of the reasons that when you detoxify, when you remove heavy metals, things start working better in the body. The body has more energy. Uh, you're, you're healing better. A lot of things happen simply because you're getting rid of the toxic metals that are getting in the way. I'll give you one more example. This is a zinc finger protein. And zinc finger proteins are really fascinating because they're necessary for cellular division. Anytime you want to, your cell has to divide, make new cells, you need zinc finger proteins to go in and help copy the DNA. So first of all, it's called a zinc finger protein because at the very center of the molecule, it's a single zinc atom that kind of holds the shape of the molecule. Now, the problem is zinc can be displaced from that molecule primarily by arsenic. Arsenic is smaller than zinc, so the molecule changes shape. When it changes shape, it inactivates. It no longer works. It's like breaking off a piece of your key. It's not going to fit the lock anymore. You're not going to be able to open that lock. So zinc finger proteins, as I said, are necessary for cellular division. That's whenever a cell needs to divide. So if you have a cut, a scrape, a broken bone, you need to heal, you need zinc finger proteins to do that. But also when you have an infection, when you have a cold, a flu, a viral attack, a bacterial attack, you need more white blood cells to fight that infection. You need to copy those white blood cells. You need zinc finger protein metabolism to help copy those blood cells. This is one of the reasons that you might suck at a zinc lozenge or take a zinc uh, vitamin with zinc in it when you have a cold or a flu, because more zinc, more zinc finger proteins, more white blood cells to fight that infection, okay? So, uh, you guys think about people when they start using the, uh, the cell defender and they start telling us things like, you know, I got a cut on my hand last night and I took some cell defender. I even put a little on my cut. It healed overnight. Your product heals cuts. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. But what it does do is help zinc finger proteins get to where they have to go and zinc finger proteins help create new cells, which helps the healing process speed along. All right, so everything starts working better when you get the heavy metals out of the way. And that's a really good example, zinc finger protein metabolism. So what is detoxification, okay? Let's talk about the fact that we're exposed to toxins every day. What does the body do naturally? Okay, so the first thing we call barrier and elimination. The skin is a great barrier. A lot of toxins do not get through the skin. They can't get through the skin. Uh, they'll be on the skin, but here's what you do. They're on the skin, but then you eat. You rub your eyes, you rub your nose, uh, you do all sorts of things that allow it to get into those toxins get into the body. So that's where washing hands comes in. We talk about the, the best thing you can possibly do for your health is wash your hands, especially before you eat, touch your nose, your face. Uh, a good example of that is arsenic. Uh, we talk about arsenic toxicity and there's arsenic in rice, there's arsenic in, in a lot of uh, different foods, but our primary exposure to arsenic, especially for our children and pets, is actually weather treated wood. Um, if you've ever gone to the uh, wood section of Home Depot, go to the section that has wood that's pressure treated for outdoor use, and you'll see a big red sign on it that says, warning, contains arsenic. 
Do not burn, do not cut without protective gear. Well, when you get that wood home and you build your decks out of it and everything like that, they take that warning sign off. But though that wood is treated with arsenic chloride to prevent termite damage, which is a pesticide. And so uh, what happens? You've got all this arsenic in the wood. In fact, one six foot two by 12, which is a normal plank of this uh, pressure treated wood has enough arsenic in it to kill 200 adults. That's a lot of arsenic, okay? So obviously you never wanna burn wood that's pressure treated, you don't use it in fires, things like that. But even when you have a wooden bench outside or wooden picnic table, you don't wanna put food on it. You don't wanna touch it and eat. So put a tablecloth over it. If you have pets, dogs or cats, do not give them chew toys on a wooden deck. They'll chew on the toy, it'll roll, roll around the wooden deck, they'll chew on that toy. It's the number one source of arsenic toxicity for our pets is chew toys on wooden decks, right? Because the chew toy picks up the arsenic and they're, they're licking it, they're, they're chewing on the chew toy. All right, so there's ways to prevent that sort of exposure. But like I said, our skin for the most part is good barrier against toxic exposure. Our digestive tract is actually a barrier against toxic exposure. And this is hard for a lot of people to understand, but when something is in the digestive tract, for all practical purposes, it's not in our body, okay? In the digestive tract, before it gets into circulation, it's got to get from the digestive tract into the bloodstream. And the digestive tract is picky about what it allows to be absorbed. So in many cases, you have something called simple elimination, where the digestive tract does not allow that toxin to, to be absorbed. It sequesters it in the digestive tract, and you basically just poop it out, okay? So that's barrier and elimination, okay? If a toxin gets into the body, actually gets into the body, now it's the job of the liver and the kidneys to flush out that toxin. Uh, the liver does something called transformation, transforms the toxin into something that's more water soluble so the kidneys can then eliminate it through the urine. Um, there's all forms of transformation. Uh, my favorite is, uh, is uh, phase two human glucuronidation. Uh, that's a form of transformation that balances hormones in the body and it's done in the liver. Uh, phase two human glucuronidation greatly reduce your risk for hormone sensitive cancers. That's testicular and prostate cancer in men, breast, ovarian, uterine, and cervical cancer in women. Uh, so uh, you could actually increase phase two human glucuronidation not only by taking my zeolite, by taking the cell defender, because that's gonna clean everything out and let the liver function better. But simply eating oranges, for example, or things with orange zest, which have deglucurated, and deglucurate is a natural compound that increases phase two human glucuronidation. So there's all sorts of things we can do to lower our risk of cancer, detoxify, and basically help the body uh, get these toxins out and be able to transform more efficiently. So if they can't eliminate the toxins or prevent them from getting in, you can't transform them, eventually you sequester. And that's what I talked about before. You start to sequester those toxins in metabolically inert or inactive tissue. The more toxins that are sequestered, the higher your body burden, your body burden of toxins. Now, the problem is there's no test that we can do, no safe test that we can do. They can tell you what your body burden is. In fact, the only way I can really tell what your body burden is, is cremation. You know, after cremation, I can measure all the toxins that come out. And you can only do that once. And so I don't recommend uh, doing that to find out what your body burden is. Um, so we do all sorts of stuff. We do uh, heavy metal analysis of hair, heavy metal analysis of urine. We do challenge tests. Where we kind of challenge the body to release those toxins and capture them in the urine, the hair. But we can never truly know what your total body burden is. I will tell you this. Everybody is different. There are people that are good excretors and there are people that are poor excretors. So you can have the same people in the same group with the same toxic exposures and some people will get sick and some people won't. And I know it's not fair, but everybody's an individual. Everybody excretes toxins at different levels. And some people change over their lifetime where they can be poor excreters and become excreters and become good excreters or great excreters become poor excreters. And there's a lot of things that go into that. It's your, it's your uh, diet, your exercise, your, and certainly your toxic exposure. So how do we decrease your body burden? What can we do? And there's lots and lots and lots of things that people do to try to detoxify. The great amount of modalities for detoxification are all about waste. How do I get things 
out of the body. How do I sweat? How do I pee? How do I poop? If I'm sweating, peeing, and pooping, and things are getting out of my body, by definition, toxins are getting out too. And so a lot of the things we do that are called detox are basically a lot, exactly that, some form of elimination. So infrared saunas, lymphatic drainage, colon cleanses, where there's energetic body work, there's acupuncture, and then there's the use of uh, vitamins, herbs, and then chelation therapy, and then diuretics and, uh, and uh, laxatives. And I'm not a big fan of diuretics and laxatives. I do like dandelion used, uh, not chronically, but used every once in a while, Cenobase teas. Uh, you know, uh, if you take a Cenobase tea that relaxes uh, peristalsis in the gut, and it will allow you to have big eliminations, the problem is it is addictive. The body starts to get used to it. And what happens if you keep taking it, you can't properly reinitiate peristalsis. And so you can wind up with a horrible effects. In fact, there's a condition called encopresis which is almost uh, uniquely among people that abuse Cenobase teas or, or laxatives, other laxatives. And you have these uh, bouts of constipation and, and horrible explosive diarrhea that goes back and forth. And so I don't recommend that on a chronic basis. Certainly you safely, Cenobase teas once, twice a week is, is great. You kind of clean yourself out naturally, uh, but it's not something I recommend as a detox modality. Um, Really, the, the thing that I'm going to talk to most tonight is chelation. And the concept of chelation is, can I use a molecule that specifically grabs onto a metal or toxin and removes us from the body? Okay, so uh, chelation has been used for, for a very long time, but it really came into its own during World War II. And World War II, uh, soldiers had a lot of exposure to lead. Uh, lead acid batteries and jeeps, lead paint on the ships and the Navy ships. And so uh, what was happening is that they were getting so much lead exposure, they were getting sick. And so they started using a compound called EDTA. EDTA is this great little molecule. If you actually saw the molecule, it looks like a hand. And each finger is slightly negatively charged. And all the fingers together have a charge of minus two. And so it's looking for something with a plus two charge to grab onto, become neutral, and then wash out of the body. It's a form of transformation. And so uh, lead has a plus two charge. So when you use EDTA, you can really get the lead out. The problem is it's only charge specific. And in fact, all chelators, all commercial chelators are charge specific. They go after things by its charge. And so... Um, EDTA is going to take out lead, but also takes out calcium and magnesium, which are necessary for life, but also have a plus two charge. And so anytime you're chelating with something like EDTA, you have to constantly keep adding calcium and magnesium back into the body. And you wind up having diminishing returns where the more EDTA you add, you're now just removing all the calcium and magnesium you keep adding into the patient. And you really never are able to get out all of the heavy metal. Uh, it's because it's, it's not specific, uh, but it will get out the bulk of the excess because that's what it's for. The problem is it's also very hard on the body. It's IV, so it's, it's done intravenously. Uh, it's very hard on the kidneys and the bladder. And a lot of the chelator winds up uh, accumulating the kidneys. And so if you have kidney dysfunction, you cannot do uh, IV chelation. So we start talking about the pros and cons. And we talk about a new approach to chelation. What else can we do that can capture these toxins and metals and safely remove them from the body without all of that other uh, side effects of chelation therapy. So here's what we start talking about zeolites. And zeolites are natural compounds. They're formed of volcanic eruptions. Over thousands of years, the lava, the ash goes into salt water for the most part. And because of heat and pressure and time, it forms these amazing minerals. Okay, these amazing minerals. Uh, zeolites are considered uh, aluminosilicates because they're made of aluminum, silica, and oxygen. It's all that's in them. And then exchangeable minerals like calcium, magnesium. Uh, the zeolite that we use uh, is called clinoptilite. So I'm going to start talking about the different types of zeolite. So if you look at a zeolite, it has a three-dimensional cage-like repeating structure. 
It's also negatively charged, one of the few negatively charged minerals found in nature. So because of a zeolite's cage-like structure and its negative charge, it has the ability to draw to itself and trap within itself a variety of different things. Now, different zeolites do different things based on the size of the pores and the crystal structure and the distribution of negative charge over the zeolite cage. Uh, and we'll talk about the different types of zeolites. In fact, there's 49 different zeolites found in nature. And we separate them by the crystal structures they form. For example, there's chain-like or acular needle-like zeolites. They form almost like spikes or pins when they form crystals. And uh, here's an example of scolocyte. But if you look up zeolite or do a search for zeolite in cancer, you might find asbestos. Asbestos is a needle-like zeolite. When you breathe in asbestos powder, those little needles get stuck in the lungs, uh, like little pins in the lungs, and they can actually increase your risk for cancer. Of course, we don't use asbestos in our products, but it is a spicule-type zeolite uh, that, uh, if you breathe it in, can be incredibly dangerous. Then there's grape-like zeolites, equid zeolites. Here's an example of one called chabazite. If you've ever seen a salt lamp, which is like a big rock and you put a, like a light bulb in it, it's supposed to detoxify the air, that's chabazite. It is a zeolite. When you heat it up, it will draw odors and things like that to it detoxify the air because this is zeolite. It's detoxifying because that's what it does. Then you have sheet-like zeolites. And we use clinoptilolite, which is a sheet-like zeolite. Sheet-like zeolites are considered to be completely safe even when inhaled. Uh, they don't cause any of the damage that something like asbestos would. And sheet-like zeolites, particularly clinoptilolite, has a long history of use and safety. So clinoptilolite has been around for over 800 years in traditional medicine. It's highly abundant. Uh, there's whole societies that have been using this for general health. In fact, there's uh, societies in India in the subcontinent called clay eaters uh, that eat this uh, clinoptilite every day as part of their diet uh, for, for general health. It's complete, considered to be completely safe and non-toxic. And the affinity scale is unbelievable. It really, really, really likes the bad stuff and hates the good stuff. And I'll go over that in a little bit, okay? So it really is a great chelator, but when I first was introduced to clinoptilolite in the 90s, and I saw some products that were using it, in fact, uh, clinoptilolite uh, was used for some health products, but primarily it's been used in animal feed for over 100 years to prevent uh, aflatoxicosis in animals. Uh, it's been used in water filtration, air purification. Uh, it's been used in, 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 in uh, water filtration for like uh, aquariums and things like that. It's even been used for clotting. In fact, there's a product called Quick Clot which is used on the battlefield, that's just desiccated clinoptilolite in a bag. And when you have a wound, they slap that bag of zeolite to your wound and it dries up the blood really quickly and, and clots the wound. So there's lots and lots of uses for clinoptilolite over the years. But as far as detoxification goes, there are a lot of issues with it as a chelator. The first issue that I came across is it's too big. When we get zeolite from the mine site, even if it's been crushed over and over and over again, the average particle size is greater than 40 microns. And we get it from 50 to 200 microns, which is like a rough granular sand. Uh, certainly it's not gonna hurt you, but it's too big to be a systemic detoxifier. It gets into the gut, it can clean out the gut, but it's not gonna get in the bloodstream, go all over the body and pull out toxins and heavy metals. It needs to be much smaller to do so. Additionally, the zeolite that we found in nature was dirty, was really, really dirty. And uh, that makes sense because that's what zeolites do. Zeolites are nature's filter. When water flows over a zeolite mine site or air blows through it, it's sucking those toxins out from the environment. And so when we get zeolite in, it's full of mercury and lead and volatile organic compounds, all this stuff. And a lot of people that were using zeolites for all sorts of things could not use it for detoxification because it was already full of all that stuff. In fact, one of the first zeolite supplements that was on the market was called Zetox, Z-E-T-O-X in the 70s. And the FDA pulled it off the market because they found high levels of mercury in the product. Now, I would argue that that product wasn't dangerous because the zeolite is so good at holding onto those metals, it's not going to release it into your body. But if it's already full of these high affinity metals, how good could it be for you? 
And so we realized that if we were going to have a product that was going to be useful, we were going to have to clean it out. We're going to have to remove all of these toxins, heavy metals that were already in the product because it limits the surface area, both inside and outside the ZLA cage that could then pull in those toxins. Uh, my favorite example was actually from Marcia Littlejohn. She talks about having a dirty sponge. If you have a dirty sponge by your sink, how good is that going to be for cleaning your counters or cleaning your dishes? But if you clean out that sponge, you squeeze it out and you wash it out and you clean it out perfectly. Well, now you have this great sponge that's now activated because now it can pull all sorts of things into it and clean up your kitchen, which is kind of what we do with our micronization activation process. Uh, so this looks, this is a mine site, a zeolite mine site that we use. And I want to point out how much clean up to light there is. This one mine site has over 500 metric, ton, I'm sorry, 500 million metric tons of clinoptilite zeolite. If you can see in the very bottom of the picture, you see two little guys. Those are regular sized guys. So this shows you how big the zeolite mine site is. So there's lots and lots and lots of this. So anyone that's worried about running out, we're not gonna run out of this stuff. So you should use it yourself. You should share it with people. You should get as many people as possible to use this. We got plenty, we got plenty for, the foreseeable thousand, next thousand years or so. So this is what the structure is of the, uh, the repeating structure of clinoptilite. As I told you, it's a repeating crystal structure. It has a 10-sided ring and an eight-sided ring followed by a 10-sided ring, eight-sided ring, it repeats. 10-side, eight-side, 10-side, eight-side. And the size of the pores are 4.2 by 4.2 and 7.5 by 4.2 angstroms, okay? So this tells you what will and will not fit inside the ZLA cage. Here's an example of cationic exchange. So just because something doesn't like the ZLA doesn't mean it won't go in. It just won't stick. It'll go in and go out, drift in and out of the ZLA. So this is a process of cationic exchange. So here's an example of lead replacing potassium, mercury replacing calcium, ammonium replacing sodium, arsenic replacing calcium, uh, and there's calcium now bumping out sodium. So this process will occur over and over and over again until the zeolite is full. And I say full with air quotes because it doesn't really get full. What happens is you wind up with a net neutral charge across the surface of the zeolite. When that happens, your body simply urinates it out. You, you eliminate it. None of the zeolite is stored in the body. There's no zero deposition of the zeolite in the body, which is why we recommend that you take it two to four times a day. So you're constantly using it and circulating it and then eliminating it. And that process occurs anywhere from four to six hours, depending on how you, what you eat, drink, how, many, how often you go to the bathroom, your activity levels, things like that. Now, if you start looking at sizes, here's where the affinity scale comes in for the zeolite, for clinoptilite. The smaller the atom and the higher the charge, the greater the affinity for the zeolite. I'll say that one more time. The smaller the atom, the higher the charge, the greater the affinity for zeolite. So all the things in nature that are bad for us tend to be small and highly charged, like arsenic, mercury, and lead. All the things that are good for us tend to be larger with a lower charge, like potassium, sodium, magnesium, and calcium. And the zeolite is really, really good at differentiating the good from the bad. So it really just pulls out the bad stuff and not the good stuff. Additionally, the smaller the atom, the deeper it can get into the nooks and crannies of the zeolite and have more points of coordination. So you can see how tightly mercury is held, but potassium and calcium can't be held. So they come in and come out, come in and come out. Now, aside from heavy metals, we found that volatile organic compounds get trapped by the zeolite as well. And I got to tell you, as a chemist, I was very incredulous when I first was told this. I said, no way. Volatile organic compounds are way too big. They can't fit into those holes. They, there's no way the zeolite can pick them up. Meanwhile, we get the zeolite from the mine site and we heat it up and all these volatile organic compounds come up. So how is it being held? So we found this paper that was published in 1996 in the journal Acta Crystallography. And they actually looked at the clinoptilite zeolite clinoptilite zeolite crystal and found how it holds on to these volatile organic compounds. And it's fascinating. The volatile organic compounds like this one here is dichlorobenzene has a flat structure, what we call a benzene ring structure. It's flat because it shares excess electrons among six carbon atoms. That flat structure lays on top of the zeolite cage. When it does, those electrons start to get shared 
with the zeolite. And because those excess electrons start to get shared in the zeolite cage, it takes on a slight positive charge and draws another zeolite cage the other side of it. And it makes a toxic sandwich, like a toxic Oreo, where the volatile organic compounds get caught between zeolite cages. And it happens very efficiently. And the question is, it's this flat structure that caused that to happen. Is there anything good for us that has that flat structure? And the answer is no. The reason these volatile organic compounds are so dangerous is because of that flat structure. Because of the small flat mo uh, molecules, they can slide into our phos uh, phospholipid membranes and get into our cells. They slide between the turns of our DNA. It's called uh, intercalation. It intercalates into our DNA and can lock inside our DNA and stop it from replicating and cause cancer. And so the flat structure of those organic, those volatile organic compounds is what makes them so dangerous. It's also what allows it to be trapped by the zeolite. So the same reason it's bad is the same reason that it could be trapped, okay? So uh, let me get into how we actually manufacture. So we have this product, we know it's good, it's got a large history of use, but we have to make it so it can be usable. So our first process is micronization. We use a proprietary, uh, we use proprietary equipment here at the lab where we use centrifugation and high pressure to crush the zeolite over and over and over again to get it submicron. Uh, our average particle size starts out greater than 40 microns and finishes actually, I see less than five microns. Our average particle size is less than one micron, all the way down to about th uh, 400 nanometers, uh, 0.4 microns, which is way small enough to be absorbed from the digestive tract into the bloodstream. And in our clinical studies, we've actually recaptured our zeolite in the bloodstream of people using it. Okay, then we need to activate, we need to clean it out. So we take this ultra micronized powder and we put it into ultra purified water and we heat it up. Once we start heating it up, the volatile organic compounds come off right away. We capture those compounds to, to measure them. Uh, and this is important too. I talked about before how people say that sometimes they get their zeolite from a pristine environment. Well, we've actually captured volatile organic compounds and analyzed them. And some of those compounds have come back as diesel fuel exhaust. Think about that, diesel fuel exhaust, which means the equipment, the mining equipment that's used to mine the zeolite is actually creating toxins that are being pulled in by the zeolite. Okay, so the mining equipment itself is making the zeolite dirty. And if you're not doing something like we are to clean out the zeolite, that's going to be in your product, that diesel fuel exhaust. Okay, so uh, at that point, we heat it up, then we add natural acids that force uh, ionic exchange, cationic exchange, and we add some natural uh, magnesium and calcium to force that cationic exchange. And we do that process over and over and over again. As the heavy metals come out, they oxidize. If you see this image, you can see the black oxidants of the heavy metals, which we remove from solution. And we filter it and do it again, filter it and do it again. It's a labor intensive process uh, to clean the zeolite out to make sure that we have a purified zeolite or a very active zeolite. And we can see this process repeat at least five times as we remove everything, remove everything, remove everything. And then we have an incredibly active product. And, you know, it's kind of funny because I, I was talking to an oncologist the other day and he asked, he says, I know you, Rick, you were the first one. I know that you uh, launched this whole category, but now everybody's got these zeolites. And I see that you have 10 milligrams of zeolite uh, in your product. This guy's saying he's got 10 grams of zeolite in a scoop. So why is your 10 milligrams better than his 10 grams? I said, because we actually create a product that works. It can get into the bloodstream. It can, uh, can work all over your body and it's active. So it can pull up toxic to heavy metals. Uh, the example I used then was aspirin. If you guys don't know, aspirin comes from willow bark. Originally came from willow bark. Ancient Egyptians used to boil willow bark and put it on your head for a headache or crush up ze uh, uh, willow bark and make tea out of it uh, to make uh, something for analgesia. Well, you can do that all day long and use tons of ze willow bark, or you could purify it down to acetyl salicylic acid and take a little tiny aspirin. And it's going to be just as good as a whole tree of willow bark. And that's what we've done. A little bit of the zeolite goes an incredibly long way, has huge amounts of surface area to pull up toxic heavy metals and be its most active. Okay. We also do final filtration to make the zeolite cakes, which we then resuspend into the final product. So what does Cell Defender actually do? So there's all sorts of things it does, but the legal claims are removes heavy metals and toxins for the body, 
therefore supporting a strong and healthy immune system. It balances your body's pH, making your pH slightly alkaline, and it can act as a potent antioxidant by wholly absorbing toxins and heavy metals. Uh, I'm gonna go into a couple of other things that the research shows, but we can't make its claims for the product. I'm just gonna talk about this, and I only have a few minutes to wrap this up. So I'm gonna go over these slides relatively quickly. So first, obviously we can't talk about our product as an antiviral agent, but there are three studies published in the use of clinoptolite and how it may actually inhibit viral replication. And the reason is basically, when a virus replicates itself, it makes pieces of itself. It makes uh, uh, all sorts of different pieces, which then have to come together in something called self-assembly. So the virus makes all the pieces, then it makes something called viral protease, which is like a pair of scissors that cuts the pieces so they're the right shape and the right charge to then come together. For some reason, those small highly charged particles, some of them, can find their way into a zeolite cage. If that happens, when the, zeolite, when the virus assembles, it could be missing pieces of itself, which then make it a non-functioning virus. Uh, and like I said, there are three studies that were published with clinoptolite. They primarily used, looked at enteroviruses or gut viruses, but they found that in vitro and in vivo, the clinoptolite did inhibit viral replication and viral uh, proliferation. So that's just one potential mechanism for how it might work to support immune system health. Additionally, uh, there were several studies done where they found that clinoptilolite may increase the activation of the P21 tumor suppressor gene. So understand that for cancer to be successful, you, cancer has to trick the body into not recognizing it as cancer. We have a lot of genes in our body that are tumor suppressor genes that look for anything wrong activate and induce apoptosis or programmed cell death or cell suicide. One of those is P21. And there were some studies conducted that showed that when the zeolites were around, for some reason, P21 was activated against those cancer cells. And it's fascinating because the mechanism is very straightforward. It's stating that normally zeolites cannot get into cells. Zeolites are way too big to get through our phospholipid membranes into a cell. But cancer cells are voracious. Cancer cells need to have all this raw material to keep making copies of themselves. So the membranes of cancer cells are really leaky. Anything that gets near a cancer cell gets sucked up through endocytosis and pulls it into the cell. So imagine you have this zeolite cage that's been kind of moving around the body, sucking up volatile organic compounds and mercury and lead and cadmium, and they get pulled inside this cancer cell. So now it's this like toxic mind that's dragging behind it all of these toxins into the cell that wakes up the P21 tumor suppressor gene and induces apoptosis. So as I said, we can't make that claim with the product. I'm just saying that there are published studies that for some reason have shown that uh, the, this particular zeal, like clinoptilolate, uh, seems to induce P21 tumor suppressor, uh, to, uh, the P21 tumor suppressor gene. Uh, and that's the proposed mechanism. So it is a fascinating potential mechanism for clinoptilolite. Lastly, this is a legal claim. We talk about balancing pH in the body and how does that work? So pH is incredibly important. We want to make sure that we have a slightly alkaline pH. Seven is neutral, below seven is acidic, above seven is alkaline. We should be about 7.4. That's an alkaline pH. When your body is slightly alkaline, everything works better. Your enzymes fold correctly, your proteins fold correctly, metabolic processes occur correctly, and it's not a good environment for the growth of bacteria, for viruses, for molds, for yeast, for, for, for uh, spores. It's just a poor environment for their growth. What happens though, is your poor diet, lack of exercise, we can wind up with a acidic environment. When we get an acidic environment now, our proteins don't fold correctly, our enzymes don't fold correctly, and it's a good environment for the growth of uh, of viruses, bacteria, and, and cancer especially. Cancer requires an acidic environment to grow. Cancer cannot grow in an alkaline environment. It's pretty simple because for cancer to replicate, it has to have a lot of DNA. DNA is an acid, so it requires an acidic environment to keep making copies of DNA. And so in an alkaline environment, cancer cannot proliferate. So uh, if you've ever seen any medical show, someone gets rushed into the ER, one of the first things they do is give them a few cc's of bicarb. And they're doing that because they're trying to make them a little more alkaline. So everything starts to work better. So bicarb drips, saline drips, the, the first thing that happens in the hospital. So here we have a, a pretty simple uh, 
view of what the pH balance is of the body using bicarbonate, okay? And what happens though, is you wind up with H plus or H3O plus, which is hydronium. Uh, the more free protons you have, the more acidic the body. In fact, pH simply means percent hydrogen. How much hydrogen do you have that's free in the body? Protons. So protons are small, positively charged atoms, and they will find their way into the negative zeolite. Now, the zeolite doesn't like it. It won't hold on to them. But the zeolite is what I call a geographic buffering agent. As it moves around the body, wherever there's a lot of protons, those protons will migrate into the zeolite cage. Once they're inside the zeolite cage, they're effectively not in solution anymore and not creating acidity. And so the zeolite will now move to an area where there's less protons and they'll move out of the cage. They'll migrate out of the cage. So it becomes a great buffering agent to help uh, buffer uh, the uh, acid around the body. Okay. Now we've done a lot of studies and all these studies are available on the website. Uh, we've done studies that actually looked at uh, electrolyte uh, balances where we didn't increase, we didn't uh, remove electrolytes from the body, but we did remove heavy metals. We looked at increase in urinary excretion of heavy metals, seeing a four to seven fold increase in, in healthy individuals, as much as a 15 fold increase in toxic individuals like uh, uh, West Virginia coal miners. I'll talk about that just really quickly. West Virginia coal miners, we know are highly toxic. They're in a toxic environment in the coal mine. We had them use the zeolite uh, for 84 days. It was a double blind placebo controlled study. And we saw as much as a 15 fold increase in heavy metal excretion. And here's what's the most important thing. We told them they could take the product any way they wanted. They just had to make sure they took the product and they were consistent in the way they took it and tell us how they took it. And I gotta tell you, it doesn't matter how they took it. They could put it right in their mouth. They could put it out of the water. There was one guy that added to his meal every night, his steak and potatoes. There was one guy that added to a glass of scotch every night. It didn't matter how they took it. As long as it got into their body, they had the same benefit. So you just got to get this in, whether you put it in your food, your water, your drink, or just put it in your mouth. Get into your body and you're going to have that benefit. Okay. We've also done a vitro analysis for volatile organic compounds. We've also measured affinity for depleted uranium and showed that it had high affinity for depleted uranium, which is used and munitions. So anyone that's been in a battlefield has the risk of uh, exposure to depleted uranium. They should use Cell Defender to remove that excess depleted uranium. Uh, looking at uh, volatile organic compounds, we have very high affinity for these volatile organic compounds, which have, are all highly carcinogenic and all found in the environment. Formaldehyde, dichlorobenzene, toluene, chloride, benzene, furans, xylenes, uh, all removed by the zeolite. So the Cell Defender is the original Zeolite colloidal suspension. I am the category creator for this product. Uh, we first uh, launched it in 2004, uh, and it's been my product all along. This is the original product that we've only made better and better and better as we've gotten better at micronizing and activating the zeolite. Uh, anyone else out there is just a poor imitator that doesn't know how to micronize and certainly doesn't know how to activate the zeolite. It's been proven safe for long term use and has been the subject of over 14 clinical studies. So, what are the recommendations for dosing? We do recommend that when you first start it, 10 drops four times a day. 10 drops four times a day, uh, that's what we call the detox dose. Bring plenty of water, because the one issue is that you need plenty of water to help with detoxification. And as they, you're removing those heavy metals, those heavy metals act as electrolytes. As you remove those heavy metals, you're actually reducing electrolytes in the body. So you're reducing fluid in the body as well. So you have to bring plenty of water to try to uh, flush all that out. After the detox dose, most people can go down to the maintenance dose, 10 drops twice a day. And we do recommend repeating the detox dose every six to 12 months. The question is, is there a high dose? There's no upper dose. You can drink whole bottles. It's not going to hurt you. But it is passively absorbed in the gut. So any more than about 15 drops at a time, you start getting a negative return for absorption. So we always recommend if you're going to try to maximize the dose for the best bang for your buck, don't take more than 10 to 15 drops at a time. And then you can do that if you want every hour. Uh, but once you go over that 15 drops, less is going to be absorbed and more is going to stay in the digestive tract. Okay. So, uh, oops. Okay, now I'm back. All right, guys. So uh, that is your master class on clinoptilate zeolite detoxification and cell defender. I know it's a lot of information, but this call was recorded. 
uh, so you can look at it over and over again. I will make these slides available to Avini so they can put up on the website and people can share the slides. Uh, and with that, I thank you for your time.